Hello and welcome to Warning Track Power. This is a special edition podcast. Again, I'm alongside Ian Fullington. What up? I am Eric Reining. What's up, Ian? How are you? I'm pretty cool. Hanging in there? <laughs> Hanging in there. Even after? Kind of tripping uh, over this Elvis Andrews news. I won. Which is why this is a special <laughs> edition. Yeah, last night I was uh, I was just uh, watching MLB Network for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, and I get this text message from Ian. I didn't have my phone on me at the time, but a couple hours later I checked it. And it's a picture of... Heisenberg with the cell phone in his hand. The la- one of the last scenes from season four of Breaking Bad. It was just the greatest thing ever, and it says I won. Because I, of course, if you listen to the last podcast, said that we need to trade Elvis Andrews and we need Jared some pro far up right now. And I was wrong, clearly. So, Ian. Well, you may, <laughs> you may not have been wrong, but the Rangers front office felt differently. Only time will tell. But... As far as my first impressions go, um, one, I'm absolutely elated. I've been a big Elvis Andrews fan. Um, I think the general sentiment is, well, let me give a little bit of background for the deal. As we understand it right now, it's eight years, $120 million. Now, there's some confusion whether it tacks on at the end of the current deal or it supersedes the last two years. You know, honestly, I'm not too sure, but I know he has an opt-out clause. Last I heard, he is guaranteed under Rangers control, excuse me, for six years. And if we're going to extrapolate this out, it's roughly about $15 million a year. And if you listen to our first podcast, I went over a little bit about how much Elvis was worth using FWAR, which, by the way, there's a new unified war now, which we'll talk about later. But Elvis is trending around a high three slash four. And if you're a believer in valuation of war around $5 million per war, then Elvis is already outperforming his war. So if you want to say a win-loss perspective on this, or if you want to view it through those lenses, then this is a definite win, in my opinion, for the Texas Rangers and for a very happy Elvis Andrews. Yeah, the money is extremely cheap. I mean, he's a total bargain. Um, I think I read just to clear up a point i'm pretty sure it's eight years after the two that he has right now okay so it'll be eight free agent years period so he'll he's under team control technically for 10 years but assuming he outperforms his contract he'll probably you know get a raise of some kind after his opt-out you know dad do you think the opt-out's a bad deal think about it from all angles here it's kind of a loaded question because I obviously have an opinion on this or else I really wouldn't be asking. But do you think the opt-out's a bad deal? Yeah, I think opt-outs are stupid because if the player is underperforming his contract, he'll just stay on and keep making you know, $15 million a year or whatever. And if he outperforms it, then he can just say, well, you know, I could become a free agent and go make more money. And then maybe he and the Rangers find a happy medium at that point, you know? Mm-hmm. But for teams, I think it's a bad deal. For players, it's, you know, awesome. Mm-hmm. See, I don't, you know, I, I agree and disagree, which is the worst answer ever. But after you go to, if you go to law school, you realize that's the only answer ever is, well, it depends. Right. So I'm going to go with the law school answer here. Well, it depends. In this particular situation, I actually kind of like it because I feel that there's a great propensity that Elvis does outperform his contract. I think that if you pulled... And when I say industry executives, I mean front office executives. If you pulled them and said, okay, do you think Elvis Andrews will be better than he has been so far? I guarantee you almost all of them would say, of course, he's getting better. And even if he says that the production he's at now, he's worth more than what he's getting paid. So naturally, he probably will opt out. And my feeling is this may not be such a bad thing for the Rangers. Because then Elvis Andrews will be hitting... I think it's around the 30-year-old, 31-year-old mark. And defensive skills tend to take a downward spiral, you know, not spiral, but they tend to trend downward unless your name is Adrian Beltre from 28 on. And so Elvis may get a better deal then from somebody else, but knowing how proficient the Rangers are at churning out middle infielders, there very well could be another Elvis Andrews or a Jerickson Profar waiting in the wings who at that point would is, would be our shortstop of the future. 
So um, I'm, I don't think th- it's such a, couple, a bad thing. I have a couple things. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. Well, yeah, because you like Elvis and everything pro Elvis Andrews is just fine with you, right? Oh yeah. I mean, I, not everything. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I would like to. You know, in a perfect world, Elvis Andrews would hit for 15 home runs a year and, you know, mm. come into the stadium on a, in a white chariot with unicorns, but you can't always get that. Ideally, Elvis Andrews would just be Jerks and Profar. Ideally, but Jerks and Profar's defense would be Elvis Andrews' defense. And Elvis' well, yeah, that would run just game. be the, the, the superhuman nine win shortstop. Yes. Basically, Mike Trout <laughs> in a shortstop's uniform. Yes. But, um,. Where are we going with this? Basically, we just got tangented off. Okay, I mean, I would just, I think this is a win-win for the Rangers, even with the opt-out clause. I think they're they're going to get a lot of surplusage from this deal, and easily. I, I think we do like to use WAR a lot, so naturally speaking, in valuations of WAR, the Rangers are going to get more than they more than they bargained for, and more, quite frankly, than a lot of people thought they would be able to get out of Elvis Andrews. I mean. Let's put it. The Rangers could easily get $50 million in surplus value off of this deal. Easily. You know, it's a, it's a fantastic I mean, when you, deal. When you, break, when you break down the math at each war being $5.5 million, up from five, then all Elvis Andrews needs to produce is about 2.7 wins, which if you round that up, that's basically a three-win shortstop. If he's a three-win shortstop over the course of his contract – he justifies the deal. I mean, I think he's going to turn into a five win player at some point, you know, I think a lot of people believe that too. If you look at projections on fan graphs, I think steamer projections have him close to a five win player this year. And that's, that's attainable in my opinion. That's very attainable. Well, what we get into next, obviously we, we both love Elvis Andrews. He's a great player, great Ranger. But now, what do we do with Jerks and Profar, and what do we do with Ian Kinsler? I know you proposed that Kinsler goes to the outfield in the last podcast. I don't think well, now that kind of looks choice. Right. I mean, now that just looks like the reality of it. Yeah. Um, I Basically, there's a few things you can infer from this. I was a little perplexed at first because I, I didn't know quite where the Rangers were going with this. But I think I figured it out. Ian Kinsler is staying at second base, or says he's staying at second base, makes the Rangers' bargaining position better going into contracts with Elvis Andrews. They could go up to Elvis and say, look, we have a shortstop of the future in Jerks and Profar. Ian Kinsler is going to stay at second base. Either we can work out a deal now, or you could potentially have to play out your contract here, risking injury, risking down year, which I don't think the Rangers front office would do that, but... There's that possibility. It makes the Rangers' position seem stronger. Now, since Elvis Andrews is our shortstop of the future and our current shortstop, Jerickson Profar is now our second baseman of the future. I don't think there's any other way that this proceeds. Obviously, you're going to have the people who like to say, oh, look, let's trade, you know, Oscar Tavares. Let's get Oscar Tavares, which, if you listen to actually um, Satellite Radio today, they had the Cardinals GM on, and when he was asked directly, so would you trade Tavares for Profar, he kind of laughed and said, well, you know, that's starting somewhere, which don't play, you know, don't think about anything into that. But it's kind of interesting to hear. Anyway, Profar is now the second baseman of the future. Kinsler will move to the outfield, if not this year, then next year, because Murphy and Cruz will be gone. Plain and simple. I just find that aspect of this extension to be the foil of everything. I mean... Like I said last time we spoke, Ian Kinsler's not going to be able to justify a $70 million extension if he's playing right field. He's an average to below average bat there. And we don't, don't even, we so. can't even project how good his defense would be. I don't think he's a below average bat. What if he can put up 30 home runs? Is that a below average his bat? His average, his career weighted runs created is a, is 112, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe only three or four second basemen last year produced that, and twenty something outfielders did. I mean, that's still. You, I mean, you, do you understand how common that is? There, I mean, twenty I mean, last outfielders. Year, Kinsler was below a hundred yeah. for the first time in his career. Okay, but if you have twenty outfielders who are producing at that level, twenty outfielders out of how many total outfielders? Let's see. There's at a very bare minimum, you have three outfielders in every team, so that's ninety. So I mean, you're basically taking the top twenty percent because you're probably going to have a fourth well, outfielder. And so we're talking about two 
two two thirds of those nineties, so sixty, because I'm not taking center fielders into account. Okay. And so I I know that doesn't WRC take into account like the position you play as well, or am I thinking of WAR? Uh, you have a general weighted runs created, and then you start divvying it up to see what the mean is of each position. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if it was position corrected or accounted for. Actually, you know what? I know it's not. Um, even that being said, I think Kinsler could be a very good outfielder. My scouting abilities are pretty awful, and when I say awful, I mean I don't have any. <laughs> but just looking at numerical data, Kinsler has a good first step, and Kinsler has a an average arm. Mike Trout does not have an average arm, and I'm being nice when I say that. And that's that's the consensus of a lot of very good scouts out there. I still think Kinsler could be a great outfielder. I know, but the th- the problem is that we we don't know that. Like, it's not a it's not a certainty because he was a shortstop in college. He's been a second baseman in the minor leagues. I think he even started out as a shortstop in the minor leagues. Um, you know, he's seen hundreds of thousands of grounders in his in his career because he's been an infielder. We can't we can't say how he'll judge a fly ball off the bat. I mean, that takes a lot of repetition, years of repetition. I mean, he's pretty good at creating pop-ups himself. (laughs) But I know I understand what you're you're saying. In my opinion, these baseball players are professional baseball players for a reason. I know this is getting a real macro bird's eye view of the whole situation, but having never played professional ball, obviously, I still believe these guys, this is their job. And if it's required that they adapt to a different position, they can. That's why they play. That's why they get paid this this money. And Kinsler knew that signing his contract too. He knew that he would probably move positions one day. Right. He's, you know, he's still an infielder though. And yes, he is. I, I, if you're asking me if I'm not excited about a, a future middle infield of Jerks and Profar and Elvis Andrews, I totally am. I just. You know, Ian Kinsler, I have so much love for him because he's like my favorite player, he has been since I was like 14. But, uh, or 14, probably like 16 or 17. I share a name but, with um, the guy. Of course I like him too. But right. at the same time, it's just, I'm all about. Go ahead. I'm all about wins mm-hmm. and money spent. I'm about like good contracts. And I think it's, I think his extension was an excellent contract if he's a second baseman. I think it's a so-so contract if he's in the outfield, or even worse, if he's at first base. I mean, at first base, yeah, but honestly, Eric, there is so much more money that has flooded baseball. I don't want to say you can afford to pay an outfielder, but you can afford to pay an outfielder. I I mean, I'm going to talk later in another podcast about like inflation in baseball as a result of TV contracts and things like that, but honestly, I think Kinsler's contract isn't bad for an outfielder even. We've seen these mammoth contracts given to outfielders recently. I mean, he's not going to be Josh Hamilton, but Josh Hamilton got a a stupid contract. Let's be honest. It's I mean, it, well, I'll probably I'll be more comfortable projecting Elvis. I mean, uh, excuse me, Ian Kinsler in the outfield if he has a great offensive year this year. Then I'll be completely comfortable saying okay. Even if he's an average or below average defensive outfielder, his bat will still make up for that to some degree. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, offense will cure all. Ultimately, if you have a good bat, there's a place for you in a major league lineup. That's my opinion. But I think this puts a lot of other wheels in motion, too. Uh, did you have another thought on that before I kind of... Oh, no. Okay. I think Go this ahead. puts a lot of other wheels in motion, too. Obviously, there was some pressure on the front office to get a deal done. Given the recent um, evacuation, I guess that's probably not the right word, but I'm going to use it, evacuation of free agents from the potential free agent market. Um, Elvis Andrews' value was only going to go up. And I think Keith Law had a really good tweet saying there is a they should cut to an emotional scene in New York where Cashman tears down a poster of Elvis Andrews in his office. Um, I think that's – that. I wouldn't be surprised if it's absolutely true. But it kind of shows how desperate teams are for homegrown talent. And this is a prime example of, although the Braves drafted them, I know. I think this is a really good example of keeping your homegrown talent close. It's a closely held group of talent. So I think this exemplifies the need to develop a good farm system because you're not going to be able to get these players in free agency anymore. You're going to be dealt the cards that you get yourself. That's 
terrible analogy, but basically... Well, bringing cards into anything is a great analogy. But yeah, I mean, this is the same model that, you know, Oakland has been operating with for the last decade, decade and a half. Tampa Bay has really perfected it God, they got a good over team. the last five or so years. Yeah, they're an awesome organization. And the Rangers have also, you know, I would throw them in that mix too because even though they have more money than Oakland and Tampa Bay, they're, they operate like a small market team. That's and very the way smart. the way that you do that, right, the way that you do that in the modern era with how everything is set up with the collective bargaining agreement is – you watch your young players play about two excellent years or whatever. Like Mike Trout will probably get his mammoth deal after this year, but give them two years and then sign them for cheap and eat up five free agent years or so like Tampa Bay with Evan Longoria. And they extended it again recently. Um, You extend them while they're young. And then once they aren't producing enough for what they want uh, in terms of money, then you cut them loose or trade them and recoup prospects for the farm system. Mm-hmm. It's it's just the way the it's wheels turn. It's very basic. Turn. And so, right. like you said, this puts a real importance on actually developing those players. And fortunately, the Rangers are one of the very, very few organizations in baseball who can turn out middle infielders. And middle infielders, will, will, they will never go out of style. You have Profar, Andrews, and Kinsler right now. You have Odor and Sardinius. I think Sardinus is going to honestly be traded, but he, he, I think he had better, I think they said he had better defensive profiles than profile. I need to check on that, but I'm pretty sure he got better grades on his defense before he got his, he was injured, but. Right. His problem is, and I think it's really his only problem is that he doesn't really have that great of plate discipline. Mm -hmm. It's better than Lurie Garcia, but. You know, Sardinius has a much higher ceiling than Lurie. Mm-hmm. I mean, Sardinius could be a first division shortstop. In my opinion, which I don't know if that really means anything, but I, I'm a firm believer that Sardinius is the shortstop of the future for the Miami Marlins. That's my opinion. Infer from that what you want, and I'm pretty sure you can draw a pretty easy line to where this is going. But he will not be with the Rangers organization at the major league level, in my opinion. He will be a short sub of the future for the Miami Marlins. I mean, we already have Jerickson Profar. Mm-hmm. Elvis Andrews is signed long term. He's just completely expendable. And hopefully we can get full value out of him because a lot of times when you have expendable parts and other teams know that you have to trade them. Like if you have a surplus, a lot like Arizona with their outfield situation during this winter, but usually can't get full value. So, you know, it would be nice if Miami would take him with, you know, who Mike old Martin Perez. Yeah. I would try to, um, how many, how many more names would you add to that list? uh, Maybe Buchel. I don't know. I'd have to see. Um, I think there's almost, there's almost a push to, I would say kind of clean out the farm system. Because there's going to be a, an influx of talent, and we're kind of going off on a tangent here, but there's going to be an influx of really, really good talent in a year or two to the upper echelon of our farm system with the Gallo, Alfaro, Brinson, Camp all getting older and all getting better. They're going to have to get rid of, when I say get rid of, but there's a lot of guys in AA and AAA who they're going to probably put as, you know, fifth names onto a deal or something if there's any blockbusters done. So, like, I think Nelly Ramirez is down in double-A this year. Am I, did I see that right? Neil? Yeah, yeah Neil I'm Ramirez, sorry, Neil Ramirez. Picture. He's down in double-A? Man, has he ever dropped or what? Well, he just had such a great first couple years in the minors. It just totally screwed the arc of his expectations. Mm-hmm. Which is unfortunate. I, I'm... <laughs> oh, well. I mean... It... When I was at... When I was at spring training, I was uh, I was with my best friend Trey, and uh, we were hanging out by the bullpen after the game. And Neil Ramirez was throwing a bullpen in front of uh, Frank Zappa, aka Mike Maddox. Mm-hmm. But um, and I feel like I was like the only player in the stadium who knew Neil Ramirez's name because I was just like I don't know, had a few beers in me. Let's just full disclosure here, but uh. Like, I uh, I shouted his name a couple times, and he looked over and smiled. It was just like, it was kind of like when I got 
Joey Gallo. I mean, I'm just name dropping hard mm-hmm. right now. Oh, so it's okay. I'm letting me. you go. <laughs> uh, when I got when I got Joey Gallo and Lewis Brinson's autograph, they were. Um, it's just like I wonder how often do people like seek them out for autographs. I think people would rather have like Aaron Cunningham be- just because he's on the official Rangers team, like out there, you know, than you know some young cat sitting in a batting cage. I think the people who really know the Rangers will get their autographs, though. Yeah. But um, any parting thoughts? I, I'd hope so. Parting thoughts. Uh, this is a great deal for the Rangers. Um, I wasn't in favor of Elvis Andrews long-term, but I can't deny pennies on the dollar. So I'm happy to see him here long-term, and I just hope it doesn't mean Ian Kinsler has to be traded. Yeah. Um, I feel about the same way. It should be very interesting going going forward, seeing what the next move the front offers makes. Definitely. And, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, taking the time out to uh, record this emergency podcast with me. It is my pleasure. Anything to put off doing tax law for a while. Yeah, right? Anything to put off a little bit of sleep or nap (laughs) time or whatever kind of extracurriculars you're into. Mm -hmm. All right, why don't you take us out, Eric? All right, man. Uh, This is for Ian Fullington. I am Eric Reining. Thank you for listening to Warning Track Power Episode 2. Take care. We will talk to you soon. If you ever change your mind, I'll be around where I used to be. Lonely heart and Lord waiting for your call.